The Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre is a unique blend of industry, government and research partners working across Australian industry with key links internationally. So what is this weird new public transport system that you can see? It's a trackless tram. That's what we're calling it. It's electric, but it's got batteries on the roof, and it is using the very latest in technology to enable public transport to be transformative. Well, the real challenge for all Australian cities is they're battling years and years of urban sprawl, and most Australian cities or all Australian cities have uh, infill targets to try and combat that. And what's happening is that the inner and middle parts of our cities are starting to transform, often creating or continue to create transport problems and more congestion because of more vehicles in those inner areas. The primary issue that we have is that land use and transport planning aren't integrated as well as they could, and we certainly don't integrate our transport land use and the financing of that infrastructure. Every city wants better public transport. It's the number one agenda across the world and certainly in Australian cities. But it's all been about government having to pay for it and they don't have much money anymore. Governments everywhere are trying to get out of paying for things. So how do we do it? Well, there is a way and it uses private sector funding because they build around the transport. And they like to do that because the value of the land is raised by the public transport. So why shouldn't they pay for it? That's the basis of value capture. And we've been researching how a new kind of value capture can enable the whole of the public transport system that you're building to be paid for out of that land value development. Railways are coming back in a big way all around the world and we've called this the, the second rail revolution. A lot of countries, they, they're seeing railways as a, a potential means to achieve their development goals and also to do that in a sustainable way. And so they need to look at how they can fund the infrastructure and how they can better integrate it with their cities. For example, the London Crossrail, the, the largest infrastructure project in Europe and through a fairly long process of negotiation, they were able to secure funding commitments from property owners and from an increment on their, their business rates. There's a railway called the Miami Brightline, which runs from Miami up to Fort Lauderdale, and that's being built by a real estate developer. But they started out in railways in the 19th century, and now they're coming back to that business. Another example, it's, it's a little bit older, is the Portland Light Rail Network, a private consortium led by Bechtel, the, the engineers, offered the, the government there a, a bit of money in return for exclusive development rights of some land around the airport there. This isn't a particularly new idea. It's, uh, it's been continuously practiced in various Asian cities for a long time. The, the Japanese in particular got very, very good at combining development and railways in this way. But it wasn't originally their idea either. It was, it was pioneered by the British, actually, and this, this sort of business model is about as old as railways themselves. There's some interesting local history around that as well. Perth Electric Tramways Company, which completely covered late 19th century, early 20th century Perth with tram tracks everywhere, and often this was a way of unlocking development. I've got one of their old promotional posters here the Nedlands Park Tramway Estate. And the landowner owned this, this huge swathe of land here. And he paid at his own expense to extend the tramway, that's that little dotted line there, all the way down to the foreshore, donated this strip of land here to the council as a sort of a foreshore park reserve, built a hotel, public baths as a form of entertainment and started selling off suburban lots. And, and that's what this poster was for advertising this new transit estate. In recent times, land use and transport have been treated in separate silos, where projects are developed in one without recognising their impact on the other. Ideally, we want to integrate the transport and land use, for example, by having the developers build the railway station or build the light rail stop. 
because then they have the incentive to both improve the quality of the land use and the attractiveness of the transport. Private sector involvement in telecommunications has been highly competitive and led to excellent customer service. Energy industry is less well advanced than telecommunications, but there's still quite good private sector involvement. Water sector is a little further behind in its evolution, where there's less private sector involvement. But the transport sector is really an example where the government is still the monopoly owner and operator of almost all the transport system. We think the best way to approach integrated transport and land use financing is to start with projects that are manageable, that are connected to the community and that have the support of local governments. We're still learning how to combine transport and land use risk. And when you're learning something, you shouldn't start with the biggest and most complex projects first. An ideal way to demonstrate integrated transport and land use funding would be to start with a corridor. Joining important destinations, but also looking at the urban fabric along those corridors, and in particular, the urban fabric around the transport stops along the corridors. It's a chance to demonstrate how those transport stops change the land use in the nature of the corridors and can contribute funding to the overall transport project. Canning City Centre is 10,000 dwellings. The intention is to really ramp this area up. We're so close to Perth City, the train line, it's all here. We're already partnering with one private sector developer on this particular site, and we're looking to upgrade the, the main arterial road, Cecil Avenue. We're looking to have a trackless tram down Cecil Avenue that will enable this future development to be connected to other areas of Perth. Developers are very key to public transport. Without developers, we won't be able to have opportunities to enrich the area, increase the amenity, uh, assist to pay for the upgrades to parks and uh, public transport opportunities. Uh, so I believe there's a real opportunity for partnership between uh, the local government, developers and transport authorities. Trackless tram is an electric rubber tired vehicle. It looks like a tram, feels like a tram. It runs in its own dedicated roadway. The differences between a trackless tram and a, uh, and a tram is it doesn't have the ugly overhead catenary wires. It doesn't have rails. So it's a, a, an easier beast to implement. Ideally, in the long term, you might want to actually green that corridor. So you may want to put down strips of concrete roadway and then have grass on either side of that. So that actually then gives you a lovely green corridor instead of what we see here around us here, this very hard urban environment. Understanding that We've got across Australia the same needs. So there is actually an industry here and, and uh, an opportunity for us to build an industry here. The time is now. Three years ago, light rail was probably the best option. The time now is to look at these new technologies and say, is this the time for us to shift into something new? We need to get into finding an Australian way of developing better public transport with better centres that create opportunities for higher density, mixed use. Cities all want that too, but to do it in a long line that can fund the rail projects that we want. And here's where the trackless tram comes in. Because the trackless tram can be put in very easily. You don't have to dig up the road to put in light rail tracks. That can cost 120 million per kilometre in some places. And many light rail projects are at least 50 million per kilometre. Trackless trams can be put in for about 5 million or less per kilometre. Now that's transformative. It's a game changer because you can do it quickly, simply, and yet it has the same effect as a railway. So the opportunity is there to now find a way to make that happen. And that is what we've been researching. The trackless tram provides that opportunity for a pragmatic solution to getting the development sector involved um, in an affordable way that helps reshape our cities. We're pleased to be working with the SBNRC because we see some good original thinking going on, but also a way of taking that thinking and turning it into practice.